Very well. Morning, everyone. Very nice to see you all. Uh, this is going to be the third and final lecture in this series on ecological networks. Uh, and today I'll try and speculate about what I think are emerging directions in the field. And it's really important to restate that. This is my opinion about what I think uh, are interesting lines of inquiry to follow that involve ecological networks. Uh, naturally, there are many other lines of research uh, that are as exciting or if not more exciting than what I'm going to talk about. But these are uh, my thoughts about what I think is going to be um, the future of the field. Um, and I'd love to hear your input um, about it. Before I get into the particular areas, uh, I just want to give uh, a bit of background about how I'm structuring uh, this talk. So I ended the uh, brief introduction to ecological networks in the first lecture with a description of multi-layer networks uh, and how they are increasingly being used in uh, research and ecological networks. Uh, so rather than just the typical single network image that I've shown where you have uh, one particular group of species uh, and then one particular type of interaction at one point in time, uh, usually one point in space, uh, the idea of multi-layer networks is to extend out that idea and include those additional dimensions explicitly. So potentially having multiple networks through time, so the same community through time, the same set of species at different geographical locations, potentially including different types of interactions and competition, feeding, facilitation among uh, those species. And multi-layer networks provide a framework for analyzing all of those different dimensions in one mathematical formalism. Uh, and this is great, but as I'll go on to say, collecting ecological data is not cheap and it's not easy. So while people are pursuing this path, the general idea of it is just to collect more and more data. Um, and then you have a larger and larger network that you can choose to analyze. Um, but it's still not quite clear exactly uh, what benefits beyond just having more data to analyze that's going to give you. So what additional either theoretical or practical advantages are you going to get from dealing with uh, from multi-layer networks? That's not to say that there aren't any. Uh, it's just that the field is still in the process of determining, okay, how can we use multi-layer networks effectively given the extreme cost of collecting more and more uh, and different types of ecological data? So this is one of the first papers in ecology that used uh, multi-layer networks, so by Sonia Kefi and colleagues, and it may look very familiar to you in the sense that you still have nodes and you still have links or edges between nodes, and here you just have, in addition to trophic links, uh, you have negative non-trophic links, so things like competition, positive non-trophic links, things like facilitation, or just any kind of species-species association that positively affects the growth rates of other species, uh, potentially decomposing uh, the network into subgroups that are spatially or temporally separated. So there's a lot of really interesting work, but we're still at the stage of just collecting these data, because particularly if you're thinking about collecting data through time, that's going to take a large amount of time. And most ecological processes uh, happen on the order of years if you want to see some change uh, in network structure. And indeed, right now, we're still at the stage of applying the kinds of techniques that were used for the very simple ecological networks to these multi-layer networks. So you can see here, Matthew Hutchinson, this is a relatively recent paper, 2019. We're still looking at things like motifs, niche partitioning, uh, and just extending those very familiar ideas for network science in general, and ecological networks in particular, to multi-layer networks. So I just want to highlight this quickly because it's the natural extension to what we've been doing so far. But in addition to this more is better kind of approach, there's also a bunch of parallel research themes uh, that people are pursuing that are not just the more is better, but how can we answer some more specific ecological questions using networks. I'm going to try and break the uh, remainder of the talk down into three parts. So data and the way that ecologists are using new advances in data collection techniques to make building ecological networks easier, faster, 
uh, and more cost effective time. As I said yesterday, most ecologists have been using a space for time substitution in order to understand how change is affecting the structure of ecological networks. But only recently have we had the ability to collect really temporally explicit data at high resolution and relatively uh, cost effectively. And in doing that, we've been able to understand better how ecological processes at shorter timescales are shaping uh, networks. There's also work involving time that is looking to go beyond ecological timescales. So beyond the days, weeks, months, years that most ecological processes happen over and looking at both meso timescales. Uh, so over uh, decades or centuries, when we think about how communities themselves actually assemble and then looking even further back in time to evolutionary timescales and trying to understand how do the interaction patterns that we see nowadays, how they were shaped by evolutionary processes over very long periods of time? And can we use network ideas to understand how those interaction patterns have either emerged now or how they have changed over much, much longer timescales than we've traditionally studied? The third and final uh, theme that I'll talk about is application. So most of what I've spoken about uh, over the past two days has been looking at ecological networks and trying to understand from a very academic perspective what they mean, how they relate to very academic notions like local stability analysis, like robustness. And the third thing really involves the idea of using ecological networks to do something, to inform decision. How can they, how can you lead to more sustainable management practices or fisheries, for example? So those are the three themes and I'm gonna take each one in turn and there'll be a few examples of areas that I think are really exciting in each of these. So let's begin with data. Uh, and I probably should have done this a bit earlier. Uh, somebody asked a question yesterday about well, how do you collect uh, network data in the first place? So I'm gonna give a brief overview now before I go into what I think the, the next emerging directions in data collection are. So the bread and butter of uh, ecological network data are observations. So, the field really started, as with most fields in ecology, of people just observing nature and then documenting what they see. So you imagine a food web, you can collect that data relatively easily by just sitting somewhere and looking to see what is around and what is eating something else. The same thing with any kind of plant pollinator data. You can sit in a field and you can see which insect pollinators visit which plants. A more formal way of collecting uh, interaction data involves having line transects in a field and walking along those line transects in a systematic way with a butterfly net, looking to see which insects land on which plants, making a note of which plant that you see, catching the insect, uh, either being able to identify it in the fields or placing it in alcohol, taking it back into the lab and having a taxonomist identify. So really, like I mentioned yesterday, the starting point is identifying what's there and then what the interaction, and usually you decide what interaction you're studying beforehand, what interaction is taking place. Another approach particularly useful for food webs is known as gut content analysis. So primarily in marine food webs, you can catch fish, uh, you will slice open its stomach, and then you can look to see what it has eaten over however long its uh, period of digestive system uh, functions. Uh, and from that, again, you're identifying the predator, the fish that you've caught, and its prey, and everything that it's eaten. And you can do this over a period of time. You can gradually build a more and more complete food web by collecting more samples, observing more and more of what's been eaten. And in the particular case of things like host parasitoid networks, as I said yesterday, you can lay out traps in the fields, uh, the insect hosts lay their eggs in these traps, uh, then the parasitoids will lay mm -hmm. their eggs inside the hosts that are in the traps, you can bring the traps into the lab, uh, extract out the eggs or larvae, and then rear them yourselves in the lab, and then see what emerges, see uh, often the parasitoid doesn't win in the interaction, and then you get an idea of uh, the rates of parasitism that's involved in the system. But when the parasitoid does emerge, you can build those host parasitoid, parasitoid food webs of how often or how frequent uh, each parasitoid species infects its hosts. So that's four uh, brief descriptions of how 
ecological networks have traditionally been built. And really, I think an exciting development uh, that's going to really change the way uh, people collect data for building networks and indeed increase the range of ecological networks can be studied is due to the emergence of molecular methods for identifying uh, solutions. So this is uh, a relatively quick and cheap way of identifying species from the tissue sample collected from an individual belonging to that species. Or if you don't know what the species is, you can collect the tissue sample and then use databases to compare uh, the genetic fingerprint of the sample you collected with a database that will house genetic samples and identifications of what that species is. So the basic idea is that, as I'm sure you know, each species has uh, a distinct uh, genome, uh, but even at smaller parts of the genome, there are significant differences between different species that you can use to, in some sense, barcode. So here uh, we have uh, a particular organism, or these are uh, different organisms. And then if you look at a small section, so just over 600 base pairs of the genome, with the same location on the genome, there are distinct differences. So these uh, colored lines show the differences between this set uh, of different specimens. And these differences, uh, which don't vary very much between individuals that belong to the same species, but do vary between individuals that belong to different species, you can consider that uh, along this section of the genome as being something like a barcode, a unique identifier for that particular species. And depending on the kind of organism that you're going to look at, there are different regions of the organism's genome that you want to focus on that function as uh, the barcode. So if you are interested in <coughs> identifying plants using molecular techniques, then you look at this part, RBCL part of the genome. In animals, you look at mitochondrial DNA, the CO1 uh, part, and these are all of the order of a few hundred uh, base pairs. Different regions for fungi uh, and bacteria. So the basic workflow for performing DNA barcoding is you sample an organism. Uh, so this can be, if you're looking at plants, you take a punch hole out of a leaf, you then extract the DNA test tube, you have some chemicals that break down the sample, uh, then you want to amplify the barcode region, so you want to select out that 600 base pair uh, region depending on the organism using some particular primers that will select for uh, that region of the genome, uh, and then you use some um, technology to basically shine a laser on that amplified part of the barcode. Uh, you get different reflections depending on which base pairs uh, are in that part. So then you get your list of A, C, T's and G's uh, in a particular order that functions, that list of base pairs functions effectively as a barcode that is unique mm -hmm. to that particular species. And then once you have uh, that barcode, you can compare the barcode for your specimen on a number of publicly available databases. So two popular ones are Bold and GenBank, uh, and these are available. You just basically input a text string of your base pairs. You then compare it onto the database, and if all goes well, people have sampled uh, the organism before, then you should get your species identification. People familiar with the idea? Does that kind of make sense? You know, species, you get a barcode, uh, and then you can either build a database yourself if no one has done that before, and then upload your findings uh, to one of the databases. Or if you are sampling from a very well understood organism, you can just upload uh, the barcode and then see what results you get from the database. So, this is great if you are interested in identifying a single species. Uh, but often, if you are interested in looking at multiple species in a particular location, or you get multiple bits of DNA from different organisms in your sample, then this barcoding doesn't really work. Instead, you have to perform a very similar related technique, metabarcoding. It's a pretty similar workflow as well. The main difference is uh, you have to separate out, after the DNA extraction stage, um, 
you need to have primers that are able to link with DNA from different organisms rather than the same DNA. So you're trying to amplify those special barcoding regions from different <coughs> kinds of species rather than the same species. And this has been a real game changer in ecology and biology more generally, uh, because it's a relatively cheap and cost-effective way of identifying lots of species. And there are a whole bunch of other terms that are generally used that uh, refer to the idea of metabarcoding, next generation sequencing that comes from the technology that's used uh, to amplify uh, different, P different, D different DNA from different organisms, high throughput sequencing, again, this idea of being able to process DNA from multiple species rather than a single species, Particularly relevant for ecological networks are eDNA, or environmental DNA, and community DNA. So I briefly want to describe the difference there. eDNA is um, any sample that's collected in the field uh, that contains DNA from multiple organisms. So it's not really selected in any particular way. Uh, you can imagine going out you know, and then scooping up some soil and then performing metabarcoding to try and understand what organisms are in that sample. Community DNA, you are more focused in trying to identify a particular set of species in the environment. So you might be interested in collecting a particular insect, crushing that insect up to see what other DNA is associated with that insect. Uh, so it's using the same metabarcoding idea with potentially different intentions. So eDNA is more what in general is out there, community DNA is a bit more focused in terms of your data collection and then analysis. So again, here we have um, the general workflow for metabarcoding. Uh, still, you have to select the appropriate DNA barcode marker. So are you looking at the CO1 region of the genome? Uh, are you looking at plants and then you're looking at RCBL? Um, and then you're going to often, if people haven't done this before, you have to build your own DNA barcode reference database. So particularly at the research level where a lot of organisms haven't been sampled before and uploaded to the online databases, that's something that you would have to do yourself. So often the sequencing is done in partnership with taxonomic experts uh, in order to build a reliable database. Once you have your database, then you can go to other locations and look for the species in your database. So very similar to the barcoding example, you collect your sample of eDNA or community DNA, uh, you brush it up, break it down, you separate out the various uh, DNA bits, you select out the barcoding region, and you use one of these high throughput sequences uh, in order to identify or separate out um, the different barcode regions. You get your uh, barcodes for each individual species. Um, that's a non-trivial step because there's just so much different DNA in the sample. So one important distinction with metabarcoding <laughs> and barcoding is there's much more intense bioinformatics component where you are looking to separate out the distinct differences in your DNA soup between the different <laughs> species and then basically look to see what are the best fits for the species in your sample relative to your database. So it sounds simple, but in uh, practice, there's lots of issues that need to be ironed out. There's potential contamination if you're looking to do community DNA because you're just collecting everything that's there. And that might include DNA from organisms that just passed by, um, you're not really interested in. So there's a, it's still as much of an art as it is a science in terms of making sense of what your uh, workflow is producing. So barcoding has been around for a while, metabarcoding the past decade or so, there's been an explosion of its use in ecology. And the next uh, frontier for molecular sequencing is the Oxford nanopore system. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with this, uh, but this is essentially the ability to use metabarcoding almost in the field, where you can do the whole process of metabarcoding, which usually involves uh, very large and expensive equipment. And I said before, it's relatively cheap and expensive, and that's because 
the equipment is usually outsourced. So there are private companies that will sequence uh, your DNA samples that you get. So usually most ecologists will collect the DNA samples. They will do some preparation themselves. So they'll often do the DNA extraction and preparation, and then you will send your samples off elsewhere. Um, if you're in a relatively well-funded university, they might have some sequencing facilities there, uh, but you're talking of the order a few dollars to run for each sample that you're looking to um, study. Uh, the machines cost tens of thousands of dollars, so it's non-trivial to set up one of these things, but you can you, know, you could go out, sample, and then send off, and then for a few hundred bucks, you could begin building your own food webs. Uh, so that is generally what happens nowadays. The Oxford Nanopore system is really interesting because you can do the whole thing on something that is about the size of a large chocolate bar, uh, or a large USB stick. So instead of these big expensive sequencing machines, you can do the extraction amplification and then also um, the sequencing uh, stage all sort of on your own. Uh, you just connect this up to your laptop and then you can also perform uh, the bioinformatics on your own machine. Um, so this is really uh, potentially gonna change how the <laughs> are collected. And you can buy a starter pack from Oxford Nanopore. I mean, it's, uh, it's, I think it's relatively affordable for science things. You can get started for about $1,000. Uh, there are materials that you need to continuously buy, uh, but it's something that ecologists are beginning to wonder, can I perform the kind of analysis that would uh, take, you'd have to send off, wait for the results to get back. Could you do this in the field? Um, so this is really exciting. It's still very early days. Uh, especially in ecology. Uh, I know some colleagues really like this. Others don't think it's worth it. They're very happy uh, with collecting the samples themselves, offloading the effort to uh, sequence uh, their samples to someone else. Uh, but the potential for this to really change how data are collected is, I think, immense. It's also worth contextualizing the cost of doing this. So a thousand bucks, it might sound a lot, it might sound like not that much uh, for you. Uh, but for reference here, this is from the NIH, National Institutes of Health in the US. Uh, there is a graph of how much it costs to sequence raw megabases of DNA. So a megabase is a million bases. Uh, back in 2001, you can see here it was about $10,000 uh, to sequence uh, 1 million uh, bases. And then we saw a gradual decline following Moore's law. I'm sure most of you know what Moore's law is. Uh, for those of you that don't, it's the general idea that the number of transistors you can fit on a chip doubles roughly every two years. So uh, there is uh, a real, becomes cheaper and cheaper to produce uh, microchips and Moore's law really predicted the, in the decreasing cost of computers and which is why we all have computers in front of us uh, right now. What's really remarkable is that for the first few years, um, the general technological advance in sequencing DNA followed Moore's law then Around 2007, which that was my PhD actually, uh, there was a massive drop that exceeded Moore's law in terms of the cost of sequencing DNA. So I put this up one to show uh, wow, uh, things have got really cheap, things that you could never imagine doing um, only recently, uh, you can do now. Uh, and secondly, just to think about a lot of you are starting your PhDs right now, just imagine in sort of like 15 years time, what kind of work could be done in your particular area due to technological advances. So this is for 1 million base pairs. For reference, the human genome has about uh, 3.2 billion base pairs or about 3,200 megabases. Uh, so NIH also has a graph uh, looking at or rescaling uh, the first figure for the cost of the human genome. So. In the early 2000s, you know, you were talking $100,000, $10,000 to sequence the, the genome of one person. Nowadays, that's down to about a thousand bucks, which 
is why, I don't know how common it is here, but in the US we have 23andMe, where you can send up your own DNA and someone will sequence it for you. You can see what your ancestry is. This is the reason why uh, 23andMe is now reasonably accessible uh, for members of the public. Uh, you'll probably notice that it shows about a thousand bucks. It's a bit cheaper for 23andMe. That's because they build in uh, a subsidy for having your data um, and using that for their own private means. So do bear that in mind if you take part in some of these uh, gene sequencing uh, companies. So the bottom line is, I think, uh, these are going to be potentially revolutionary uh, technological advances for building network data. And right now, a lot of people are trying to figure out well, exactly how are we going to use it. The technology is there, but the challenge is really adapting these new methods for ecological use cases. It really is non-trivial to use the technology to collect ecological data that you can use to build networks. It's definitely not as straightforward as observation. And even when we think about observation, it took decades of scientific thinking to get to protocols that we felt were good enough and reliable enough to draw reasonable inferences from the data that we were collecting using our models, using statistical techniques. So we're already at that stage. This is really potentially a game changer, but we're still figuring out the best way of using it. So I want to give you a few examples of what ecologists are doing. I'm going to start with some of my own work uh, that involves molecular sequencing. So I talked about host parasitoid networks a lot recently because it's one of my areas of study. And I said, primarily, uh, we lay out traps uh, and then we collect um, hosts that sometimes are infected by parasitoids and then we rear them in the lab. Uh, the adult parasitoids uh, leave uh, the host they kill the host, and then you can identify both the host and the parasitoid to build the webs. But this is the final stage of what I'll categorize as a three-stage process that involves the life history of a parasitoid. And what we're using molecular sequencing to do is try and build food webs across the life history stages. So when you're out in the field, the host lays an egg, and then uh, the egg grows and then it turns into a larvae and if there has been an infection by a parasitoid you also have um, the parasitoid larvae inside the host larvae. At this stage what's really interesting is you can get multiple infections from different parasitoids on the same host egg or larvae and if you go if you study these you can see them. They're very small, uh, but the infections are sort of like little black dots within the host larvae. So you get multiple attacks by parasitoids of the same host. When the larvae of the host moves to the pupil stage, only one parasitoid can win out. So there's competition within a single individual of the host where only one parasitoid can begin its sort of intermediate life history stage. And then as you move from the pupil to the adult stage, this is where um, you either get the host immune system winning out and, then, and is able to kill the parasitoid before the parasitoid completes its life cycle. So at this stage, either the host wins out and then the host emerges and the parasitism was unsuccessful or the parasitoid <laughs> wins out and it kills its host and emerges. So what we're looking to do with molecular sequencing that you can't do with rearing, because there's no way that you can identify infections at this stage. And at this stage is to use molecular sequencing to take samples of larvae and pupa, and then use molecular sequencing to identify well, what infected the host at this stage. When you're at the pupil stage, which parasitoid is in which host? So basically look to track the structure of the food webs through the different life history stages. So a working hypothesis, which is consistent with most theories in ecology, is that specialist parasitoids, so parasitoids that have a relatively narrow diet breadth, will attack fewer hosts, but they will outcompete generalists. So parasitoids that have larger diet breadths that are attacking the same host individual 
And the specialist parasitoids, because of the tight coevolution and their specialism, presumably they'll be better at overcoming host defenses. Potentially they will have mechanisms for outcompeting the generalist parasitoids. And therefore, the specialist parasitoids will result in disproportionately more successful parasitism events compared to generalist parasitoids. And that's something that you wouldn't necessarily see if you're only studying this final adult stage, not least because specialist parasitoids tend to be uh, less common than generalist parasitoids in terms of abundance. So here I kind of got the, the, uh, the raw abundance or frequency networks, and then looking at the interaction preferences. So this is just our hypothesis at the moment. But to think of it in terms of interaction preferences that I introduced yesterday, we would expect that the changes in interaction preferences across life history stages are smaller and less variable for specialists compared to generalists. So in practice, our plan is to go across the eastern seaboard of the US. This is New Hampshire, Maryland, South Carolina, and Florida. And then we're going to lay out our traps. And these are peaches. These are literally just peaches uh, because uh, we're going to be studying fly hosts and they lay their eggs in rotten fruit. So we're going to lay out some peach traps, collect the peaches, and then at the larval and pupil stages, we're going to perform next generation sequencing uh, to identify what the host is and what the parasitoid is. And this can be done much, much quicker. Uh, or it's really sort of impossible to do without next generation uh, sequencing. But then for the third stage, we're still going to bring in uh, samples and rear them in the lab conventionally because that's still the most efficient way of identifying at that third uh, stage. So right now we're in the process of building the libraries, and that is not a straightforward task. Uh, particularly for host parasitoid uh, systems because they're so small and there's a lot of environmental contamination. So really trying to uh, pass out the DNA sequences that you get and really reliably say, okay, at the very small larval stages, for example, these are the parasitoids that actually infected a given individual rather than just, oh, they were around in the environment because there are still traces of DNA. So there's still a lot of bioinformatics work that we're developing in order to say this was an actual infection rather than these species just happened to be around. So this is the difficulty in moving between, say, environmental DNA, what just happens to be in the region, compared to community DNA, a more specific idea of what the species are and which species are involved in particular interactions. So another project um, that I sort of bring up because I just think it's really funny, I have a colleague, Jason Schmidt at the University of Georgia. Uh, he worked in agricultural systems and we're trying to build uh, food webs in agricultural systems uh, just to understand how species diversity and interaction patterns change in the general area of uh, corn and other kind of crop growing uh, regions. And part of that is looking at beetles in food webs. Um, and uh, we're really looking to identify well, what do beetles eat? Because they're both uh, potentially pests that eat the crops, but they're also potentially organisms that control more damaging pests. So we want to know what beetles are eating. So Jason goes in the area, and he builds traps, which are basically holes in the ground that beetles fall into, and then they can't escape. Uh, we want to know what beetles are eating, and you want to know pretty quickly what they've eaten, because they eat something, they digest it, and then it's difficult to track. So uh, you can't perform gut content analysis uh, with beetles very easily as you can with fish. So what Jason does is he basically walks around with a hot tub for beetles, uh, because when you take a beetle, you put it in warm water, and as you gradually increase the temperature, that causes beetles to vomit. So Jason walks around with a small, you know, battery powered uh, water heater, puts beetles in, holds them carefully, gets them to vomit, and then will perform next gen sequencing on the vomit to identify what uh, plants uh, and other organisms the beetles uh, have eaten. And from that, we're beginning to build a more extensive food web of what is around and what the interactions are in an agricultural setting. But <laughs> before working with Jason, I never heard of this, and I was like taken aback when he said, well, that's what 
that's what he's going to do uh, to build these food webs. So one other area where metabarcoding is potentially revolutionary is for biological control research. Uh, so like I mentioned the other day, parasitoids are the natural predators of many agricultural pests, and often governments and farmers will introduce parasitoids into their uh, farm to control pest populations. But it's not always obvious, especially if you have a brand new pest, what the natural predators, so both native, what might already be around, uh, where uh, the pest is coming from, and non-native, so in its introduced region, what its natural predators uh, might be. So we need a really quick way of identifying uh, what the interactions are between uh, not just the pest, but also the potential control agent, the parasitoid you're introducing, and what else it eats, and also what eats it. So we really want a quick way of building a food web that involves uh, the pest, uh, the parasitoid, the control agent, and everything else that it's connected to. You also want to know, once you've released uh, a control <clears throat> agent, what, you know, where it is, what effect it potentially might be having on native communities. Now, the traditional approach is extremely costly and time-consuming. It involves uh, collecting potential control agents and then testing in a lab one by one uh, what organisms it could feed on, what could feed on it. Uh, but using next generation sequencing, uh, you can really speed up the process, both in terms of rapidly detecting a biological control agent and host associations in the native region of the control agent. So often if you have a newly introduced pest, it comes from somewhere else. Uh, so then you need to go to its origin to identify well, what eats it in its native range. Uh, so that's often very tricky to do. Um, because it's often a rarely a not commonly sampled region. But if you have this ability to very quickly sample uh, in the field, identify using next generation sequence, build libraries, you can very quickly get a better idea of the network structure that involves um, the control agent and the pest in both its native and its non-native uh, region. You can also use uh, next generation sequencing to then quickly track the spread of your um, introduced biological control agent, the parasitoid, and indeed also the pest. Increasingly, uh, farmers and governments are using next generation sequencing to look at the spread of pests in the local environment. So we proposed this idea uh, in a recent paper. One important point that we highlight is the need to link genetic databases to an authoritative genetic database. And by that, I mean a database in which the genetic samples are matched to specimens that are kept on file and have been identified by taxonomic authorities, usually folks that work in a museum, and they're the experts in terms of identifying uh, the species. And there are two reasons why having an authoritative database uh, is necessary. The first is that in the public databases, there is so much misidentification of species because anyone can upload anything to the database. You get your sample, you give it a name, you can upload it. Now you're meant to be pretty sure that the name that you give your genetic sample that you upload is correct, but there's basically no guarantee that that's happening. You can upload whatever you want. And we did a few studies that showed, well, actually the parasitoids are very difficult to identify because they're tiny, they're smaller than the size of your, like the, the nail on your little finger, um, that it's really not reliable for most purposes. Um, the second is that if you're going to introduce a non-native biological control agent, legally speaking, at least in the US, you really need to know what the organisms are. Like there are <laughs> requirements for testing that the public databases simply don't satisfy because they are not reliable enough. Uh, so we, um, we wrote this paper that basically serves as a model uh, paper for creating an authoritative genetic database, in this case, focusing on uh, Drosophila parasitoids. So parasitoids that infect uh, Drosophila flies. Uh, and this is relevant because a lot of uh, agricultural pests are flies. Um, one particularly damaging one is Drosophila suzuki, uh, which is 
from Asia, but I think about 20, 25 years ago, was introduced accidentally into the Western US and has decimated fruit crops in California uh, because it is able, unlike most flies, to lay its eggs in non-rotten fruit. Uh, so uh, most flies are not that damaging because the fruit falls off the tree and that's where they lay their eggs. But with this particular uh, species of fly, it lays its eggs inside fruit that's still on the tree. Uh, so that's how it's damaging the crops because they go bad much quicker. People don't want to eat uh, fruit that has flies in them. Uh, but also what's kind of remarkable with this invasive species in the U.S., is because it lays its eggs in non-rotten fruit, the fruit gets transported. So it's basically hijacked human uh, infrastructure in order to massively increase its dispersal ability. So in a period of about 10 years, it moved from California over to the East Coast. So um, this is just to say that it's becoming an increasingly important area of research to understand uh, the network structure of pests and biological control agents. <laughs> So the big thing here is if you're really keen to perform uh, genetic analysis, there are publicly available databases, that's fine, but you need to be careful and an arguably better approach if you work within a relatively narrow field is to see if there is an authoritative genetic database that you can use, where it's a bit like you know, in police dramas, the chain of evidence sort of idea where if you can really rely on the identifications that are being given in the database, because you have the specimen on file somewhere, you have the name of the taxonomist that made the identification, and you can essentially verify that the sequence data in your database is correct. This is also great for science, because if you've ever used GenBank uh, or Bold, uh, the barcode of life database, something like that, then you'll see that often samples aren't identified to the species level. So you'll often see mainly genus level for a lot of organisms, uh, and then often it'll be genus level species one, species two, species three. If you're lucky, sometimes in a given study, you might just have things identified to an operational taxonomic unit, which is essentially the idea that this is just a sequence of DNA that is different enough from another sequence of DNA that they can call it different species in their study. So from a scientific perspective, that's not especially helpful because you can't really rely on the information from one study to help you in a subsequent study. But if you have a reliable identification, that's gonna help with science because you can reliably track how species have been named uh, and see the, diff the differences in DNA and really verify that this species in one study is the same species in another study. Another use uh, of molecular sequencing that I think is really cool is for biodiversity monitoring. So in this study here by Norgard, and this came out in 2021, they used environmental DNA extracted from feces in order to uh, map biodiversity across an urban environment. So they use generalist predators because they're more mobile, more, more mobile, they move around, they eat lots of different things. And they were able to show that um, by using eDNA, it couldn't replace traditional biodiversity uh, assessment approaches, which are still rooted largely in observation, counting things, seeing what's there, but it really enhanced uh, and made more efficient the ability to uh, perform biodiversity assessments by analyzing what's present in the feces of generalist predators and looking to see how that might vary across different land uses. So that was uh, a bit about data. I want to talk now about some advances looking at the temporal dimension of ecological networks. So like I mentioned yesterday, most ecological research involving networks has used a space for time substitution in order to study the effect of change. Uh, so rather than looking at a plot of rainforest and then chopping down trees and then continuously collecting data, you sampled different field sites within a region that had both forested and converted uh, field sites and then basically formed an environmental gradient of networks as a proxy for if you were to actually make that change yourself. There's also been in ecology a focus, as you would expect, on ecological 
processes. So these are things uh, that are happening at relatively uh, short timescales uh, and they're not considering things like, well, how does the community that you're studying assemble in the first place? What's the role of evolution in shaping which species are around? The focus has primarily been on ecological processes, which is why I've talked mainly about things like trophic interactions in food webs, so things eating other things, pollinators visiting plants. These are processes that are happening on a daily basis and the network structure is potentially changing over weeks to months to years. Uh, so ecological processes tend to be things that involve interactions that you can see. So here uh, is uh, a really cool ecological process uh, that is studied a lot using networks. At first glance, you might think uh, this is uh, a host parasitoid interaction where you have an aphid host and a wasp parasitoids, uh, that's not too far off the mark, but this is actually uh, an ecological interaction that's known as hyperparasitoidism. So if you look carefully, this parasitoid is actually infecting another parasitoid that's growing inside the aphid. So if we zoom in here, you can see that this aphid individual had already been infected by a different parasitoid wasp, uh, that parasitoid wasp is growing, it's currently at its larval stage inside the aphid host, and there is another hyperparasitoid that searches for parasitoids that have infected other aphids. So here you can see that it's the, the hyperparasitoid is infecting uh, the parasitoid with the aim of it growing inside the parasitoid first, and then once it kills the parasitoid, it ultimately kills the aphid host. So instead of the bipartite network, you end up with a tripartite network of which hyperparasitoids infect which parasitoids, which infect which hosts. So I thought that was just a cool example uh, to show you. And like I mentioned yesterday, uh, there's been very little wor work on time results ecological network data, largely because it didn't really exist. But, we, the, but more recently, data has come out where you can have plant pollinator interaction data at the level of the day, which is really remarkable um, and has required a lot of work from my colleagues uh, in order to really systematically spend time in the field on a daily basis, collecting information on <coughs> which pollinating insects visit which plants. So the availability of this data has led uh, to Dev and myself being able to study this pattern of nestedness um, at much shorter timescales than people had done before. So what we were able to show is that nestedness can actually emerge through a relatively simple ecological process. So whereas the current best explanation for nestedness, as I said yesterday, involves looking at the degree of uh, the species, so their diet breadth, which is something you can only really understand after you've collected the data. In fact, nestedness can emerge from a simple process based on when species co-occur, and that temporal dimension in ecology is known as phenology. So we propose a phenology model to explain nestedness where you have the time uh, or through time when each species is active in the environment, and then we can look at the number of times that uh, species tend to be co-present with one another. And by simply saying that the more often you are around when your interaction partner is around, you are more likely to interact with them. The pollinator is more likely to visit the plant that's around more often. Those interactions then gradually over the period of a field season build this pattern of nestings. So we can see here, um, so we also looked at some human systems, but here we looked at, this is an example of a plant system, and this is a measure of nestedness from zero to one. One is the nestedness of an empirical network. You can see that the amount of nestedness tends to increase as we move through time, as more and more interaction data are collected. So we were able to show for the first time that Nestedness was emerging as a, as a natural process of just the relative availability of interaction partners. So if you want to learn more about this, come talk to me. I can send you uh, the preprint, which is available. 
Um, another neat project that I want to mention, uh, which is being led by uh, my PhD student who's based at the Czech Academy of Sciences, who studies host parasitoid networks, is looking at how easy or difficult it is to put together ecological community. So now we're looking at longer timescales uh, than ecological processes. So the timescales on which communities uh, assemble from a regional pool uh, of species. Uh, and what's kind of fun is that our theoretical basis actually starts with a video game. So I don't know whether you've ever played Picross uh, on your phone or on your like Nintendo Switch or something, uh, but it's sort of a puzzle game and I'll explain what it is in a second. More formally, it's known as a nonogram. So a nonogram puzzle is a grid like this and it has clues along rows and columns and those clues tell you how many um, how many of these entries you should fill in, uh, then there's a gap where you don't fill it in, then you fill in another number of consecutive elements. So I'm gonna walk through like the start of solving this puzzle to give you an idea of how it works, but just to sort of foreshadow a bit, this looks a lot like an adjacency matrix or bipartite matrix. Uh, so this is where we're gonna to lead to your community assembly, but first I wanna to explain to you a non-ground puzzle. So these are the clues. We want to fill in this grid and eventually we'll get some kind of neat picture that emerges. That's the way that people find it fun. Uh, so you look at the clues and the first thing, uh, this is a 10 by 10 grid. So you look, there's a clue that says, okay, I've got 10 continuous entries that are filled in. That's pretty straightforward. You don't need any other information. You've got 10. Uh, that might not be the only clue that you could have filled in straight away. There's this one here, two by one. That tells you that there are two elements that you fill in. Then there's a gap of one or more elements that you don't fill in. Then five continuous elements that you fill in, one, two, three, four, five. Then another gap, and then one more. Finally, uh, if you think about this for a bit, two, five, one, uh, there's, you know, there's only one way of arranging the coloring in of uh, the elements uh, based on that clue. Once you've filled in some, so once you know that, okay, these are definitely filled in, and sometimes, you know, this is definitely not filled in, then you can start working your way through the other clues. So here is nine, and we couldn't fill that in initially because you could either have nine straight down there with one at the end, with an empty one at the end, or an empty one to begin with and nine down. But once we've fixed one of these uh, entries, then we know that the nine must be from there. And then you can basically work through the clues. You can start filling in other rows and columns. Sometimes you can't complete the clue altogether. So here we can only fill in uh, five of the seven uh, because all you know is there need to be seven continuously. So you can imagine if I had a block of seven and I start moving it along, <laughs> which are the elements that definitely have to be filled in. Uh, so anyway, I'm giving you a tutorial on how to uh, solve monograms, uh, but you can keep working through it. And, People find this a lot of fun. Uh, and then eventually you can complete the nonogram and you get uh, a cute squirrel. Um, and this is uh, general, so it's called Picross. Um, and then there are various different difficulties of Picross. So I gave the example of a squirrel, that's a relatively easy one. And you can sort of see that the larger the grid, the more complex the clues that you have Often the more checkerboard the pattern, the harder the puzzle, because it's less easy to, con to uh, confirm that this is definitely a filled in element or not a filled in element. But anyway, the important things to recognize is how similar the grid is to an adjacency matrix and the idea that you can get different difficulties of puzzle. So how do we apply this to ecological uh, networks? So our plan is to essentially take an empirical network and then rewrite it as a nonogram. So here we have a bipartite network, we have different species along rows and columns, and we have clues that essentially represent the diet rep, but the diet rep conditioned on any kind of intervality. If you remember from yesterday, there was this idea in ecology the organisms feed largely along intervals. Like there's a, there are a few dimensions where species will feed continuously or contiguously. And then maybe there's a gap, there's a break because there's another dimension 
uh, that's important. And we can represent those conditions as nonagram clues. And then once you've rewritten your system as a nonagram, then you can begin to ask the question, well, how difficult would it be to assemble a functioning community? So I showed you an easy, medium, and difficult uh, examples of nonograms here. These are from the perspective of humans. And these are kind of like made up grouping. Someone has to design these uh, puzzles and then they're published and they say, okay, it's easy, it's difficult, based on how a human would solve this. But there's also a whole bunch of work done in computer science that is trying to formally assess how difficult a monogram is to solve algorithmically. So there's some great work actually being done here in the Netherlands. I don't know if anyone's familiar with these guys, uh, but this is, uh, this is the start of a line of work that was trying to formally study uh, how difficult nonograms uh, are. And we've since sort of extended this idea for our own purposes, and our general workflow is going to be sort of taking uh, an ecological network, a host parasitoid network most likely, converting it into a nonogram puzzle, and then calculating its difficulty using um, systematic algorithms and then correlating difficulty with various network structure properties and metadata. So is it the case that the more nested the network, the less difficult it is in order to form? Uh, also looking at real world metadata. So if you have more forest cover, is that going to be easy or difficult in order to assemble communities in those kinds of environments? One of the neat things that we can do is because uh, my PhD student uh, is not only a theoretician, but collects field data and also date and runs laboratory experiments, is we have a host parasitoid community that we took from the field in Australia. We are growing lines in the field uh, in the Czech Republic, and we are able to actually assemble different combinations of species in the lab and see whether they can take. So we'll be able to both... Uh, propose whether networks are difficult to assemble, but then also test them in the lab. So that's that one project. Um, it's coming up to 11. I will talk about this project that maybe we'll take a break. Uh, so in addition to this sort of monogram idea, which is kind of left field, there are also some other approaches to understanding how communities assemble that most that are more closely related to conventional ecological theory. So uh, briefly speaking, community assembly, you can think of as starting with a regional species pool. So it might be all of the species that you can find in the Netherlands. That's your regional species. pool. That's your total list of all species that you might find at various locations within the Netherlands. And then there are a number of different filters the, these are conceptual filters that the species in the regional pool must pass through before you get a community at one particular location. So there's an environmental filter. Are the climatic conditions suitable for a given species to be found at a particular location? So the, is the climate suitable? Dispersal filter, can the species actually get to that location from wherever its starting point is? In trust specific competition, are there enough resources to support a population of that species? So still focusing on that individual species. Then you have a filter that asks about interspecific competition. Are there really strong competitors likely to be found at that location that would competitively exclude that population from being able to establish, even though the environment is fine, even though species can physically get there, even though there are otherwise enough resources to support a population, uh, and then finally, there are sort of, are there any other interspecific reasons? Are there any other antagonists at that location? Are there sufficient mutualists or uh, other facilitative species that enable your focal species to get to a particular location? So this is the way that people think about community assembly more generally. Uh, and one of my friends, Lauren Panicio, uh, has proposed extending this idea to not just ask about what species are you likely to find at a given location, but which species can get to a given location and how their interaction patterns might vary depending on whether uh, the community is otherwise isolated from the source of species or is closer to the source of species. So often this is used to understand 
um, the network structure of communities on different islands, where it's much easier to look at the difference between isolated and proximate. But the general idea still holds that most of community assembly has focused on species composition at particular locations. And what Lauren is trying to do is extend out the idea of not only what species are there, but how they might interact with one another. And also in addition to what species are there, whether the interaction patterns change based on location and whether there are any other filters that influence how interaction patterns might vary between different locations. So this is all very well in theory, but it's kind of tricky to test uh, with data. Uh, one called approach is to use natural what are known as chrono sequences. So sequences in time. So like the islands of Hawaii, uh, they have different um, evolutionary ages. So this is one way of testing these ideas related to community assembly, which span off about 5 million years, but it varies greatly depending on the system uh, that you're interested in. Uh, this is still, yes, a space for time substitution, but there's not really much we can do about that when we're looking at these uh, kinds of timescales. But at least this is one way of beginning to investigate timescales beyond those of purely ecological processes. So uh, Lauren and one of my colleagues, uh, UC Berkeley, Rosemary Gillespie, and she spent her entire career collecting uh, network data at the various different islands in Hawaii. And we're really interested in understanding how network structure varies, uh, both in terms of ecological processes, but also the constraints imposed by the ability of species to get to those locations and communities establishing differentially depending on how far they are from the mainlands, but also how the various different compositions of species based on those various filters I described impact what species are there and ultimately the pattern of interactions. So uh, I think this is a good point to stop. Um, Let's take a 10 minute break and then you can ask me any questions uh, about this either during the break or when we get back and then I'll continue with time and then talk a bit about applications. Okay. Um, so we're going to finish off talking about time by looking at evolutionary time scales and how folks are trying to understand network structure uh, by accounting for evolution, potentially even tracking how network structure changes over evolutionary time scales. Uh, so by evolutionary time scales, I mean sort of things up to about 3 billion years, which is just a bit under where we think life began on Earth. So this is probably a large estimate for the time scales involved, but uh, just to show the difference between ecological time scales, talking about say decades, maybe centuries, um, community assembly, sort of millions of years potentially, evolutionary time scales, billions of years. Uh, unfortunately, there's no real space for time substitution that works for evolutionary time scales. So the general strategy that ecologists uh, and uh, population geneticists, biologists are taking is to build large simulation models made up of blocks of well understood uh, evolutionary and ecological theory, and then use contemporary uh, community ecological data to infer model parameters of those well understood blocks. So this is MESS uh, by my colleague Isaac Overtast. MESS stands for Massive Eco Evolutionary Synthesis Simulations. Uh, I wasn't really sure about this name, uh, but mm -hmm. Isaac loved it. Um, I wasn't involved in this work uh, initially, um, but it's called MESS. And then the general plan is you have um, community level data, so abundances, genetic sequence data uh, for the species in your community, trait values, uh, and then you have um, a whole bunch of sort of blocks of uh, simulation approaches uh, that include various evolutionary and ecological processes. So there's models of speciation, extinction, et cetera, birth death processes, competition. Uh, there's some pop gen uh, models. Each of these components is well understood. They're sort of thrown into the model. And then you use a machine learning approach to basically try and find the best set of parameters that ultimately explains your input data. So it's based on uh, all of the general theoretical frameworks that we believe to be correct in terms of how species speciate, how you get new species emerging, how they go extinct, 
And then with a final goal of best fitting your model to what we see nowadays, you get these distributions of what we think uh, the various uh, parameters of the model should be. The approach doesn't currently include uh, explicit network data, but this is something I'm working with Isaac to try and introduce into later versions of this model. So this comes from an area of work, which is largely population genetics. So they don't really consider ecological networks. So this work largely started not considering networks at all, but the next uh, versions of this, we're really hoping to include some idea of how network structure is potentially changing or even, and even arguably more easily, having it as one of the inputs that you look at the end and then asking what are the most likely parameters that give rise to particular network structures. I should add that MESS isn't the only simulation approach uh, available. There's also Genesis. Um, I don't know what it is about these pop gen people that they really, they, I think they spend a lot of time trying to come up with the names um, <laughs> of their models. So it took me a while to figure out uh, what Genesis, which is also kind of ironic in general, but Genesis stands for a general engine for eco-evolutionary simulations. And this is kind of a real stretch. You've got <laughs> simulations as contributing three of the letters. Um, at some point, I don't know, this is also reminds me of uh, faculty and they're trying to come up with center names um, and then try to come up with a nice acronym for uh, their center that you can just use and a remarkable amount of energy is expended naming stuff. But anyway, this was um, proposed by Oscar Hagen. Uh, they are kind of competing approaches, but also everyone knows one another. So I know both Isaac uh, and Oscar and they know one another. It's a very similar approach uh, to MESS. Um, the main difference is this is a bit more mechanistic in a sense. Uh, so MESS is, I would say, more uh, statistical, uh, where you are uh, proposing prior distributions uh, for various parameters. And then based on the data, you get posterior distributions. Uh, with Oscar's approach with Genesis, uh, you have um, Spaking explicit landscape, it's more like an agent based modeling approach uh, where you code in a configuration file, depreciation takes place, how dispersal takes place, but you explicitly have like a grid, uh, and then species can move between different grids, they can speciate within a grid, uh, and so on. Uh, so it's another approach, but it's based on the same idea of you have these components of well understood if ecological and evolutionary processes that you allow to play out, and then you compare the output of those simulations to empirical data, so either distribution data where you find species, potentially fossil data, phylogenetic data, uh, etc. This approach also doesn't explicitly build in networks into it, uh, but this is something that I'm talking to Oscar about, again, in the next version, I think, as people from population genetics are getting more interested in the pattern of interactions, not just these big summary statistics uh, for communities, but also both what kind of ecological networks are emerging from these processes uh, and also understanding how interaction structure might constrain these various processes. Everyone's becoming more interested in incorporating networks into work at evolutionary timescales. Uh, and I think there's uh, the main way of doing this, and it's not the uh, interactions, or I should probably say associations aren't included in this, these models, they are, but they're done in a very general sense of you have these different species and the number of species is changing. So you have the equivalent of an adjacency matrix, but a lot like Robert May's work, the adjacency matrix idea, it's just the entries are drawn at random or, in, or you can think of it as being a fully connected network. In principle, any species can interact with any other species or their growth rates are dependent on every other species. So the first thing that we're looking to do is really take that um, adjacency matrix that already exists within both of these frameworks and ask more carefully about how that's structured. So you can think of it as 
you know, moving on from Robert May's initial assumptions about how the community matrix is structured and ask about if you have particular structures, particular constraints on what can interact with what, how might that change both how the processes feed back to one another through time, but also how the ultimate network structure emerges differentially, depending on whether you impose network structure when you have speciation taking place or competition, and if you don't. Okay, so if you remember, I said at the very beginning of this uh, section, there wasn't really any space for time substitution that works for evolutionary time scales. I think that's generally true, but one area that verges on being able to do that involves paleoecological networks. And this is where you build interaction networks from the fossil record. And I want to highlight some really cool work that's being done by a former mentee of mine, Anshman Swain. Uh, he's the first author on this paper. He's now a postdoc fellow at Harvard. Uh, he's been assembling plant herbivore networks based on fossil data. So you have fossilized plants, and then you have some characterization of what is feeding on those plants. But this is collected from data in the fossil record, so it's highly, highly unlikely that you're going to capture the fossil record and interaction actually happening. So even though this looks kind of familiar to the other bipartite networks that I've shown you before, at this top level, these are not species because how do you know what species has been feeding on this plant based on the fossil record? But there's a really, I think, ingenious way that they've uh, sort of dealt with this. And at the top level, you don't have species per se, but you have what are called damage types. So people can look in the fossil record and based on the bite marks in the fossil record, they have unique designations for the kind of damage that you can find on leaves. And there's been a lot of work done to, besides building the network sort of independently and producing these, one of a better word, guidebooks that document uh, the bite patterns on fossilized leaves. So you can see here one extract from uh, the main guidebook that's used where you have sort of whole feeding patterns in leaves in the fossil record, margin feeding, so the edges, uh, various other ways in which leaves can be damaged. And Anshman used that information to build these networks. And these damage types are kind of a proxy for species. You know, the assumption is uh, different organisms are probably closely related to one another genetically if they are producing the same kind of damage on the leaves. Uh, so I think this is really cool work. Um, there has been relatively little work done on looking at building networks from the fossil record, but I think Anshuman is hopefully going to start um, a line of research that others will follow, because then it might give us some way of uh, building time points through evolutionary time about what network structure is looking like and potentially get a better idea of how evolutionary processes shape the structure of ecological networks that we see today. So hopefully that's been an interesting overview of how time is being considered in ecological networks. Uh, I tried to give you some examples from uh, involving ecological timescales, uh, intermediate timescales of community assembly, and then finally a few approaches to studying evolutionary timescales. So now I want to talk in my third and final part about application, how ecological networks might be used to inform decision making uh, in the so-called real world. And I want to open this part with a kind of cool story that I read on the BBC a couple of months ago. Uh, overall, it's about how humans straightened a river to help with agriculture. So you know, rivers, by their very nature, meander uh, around. And how long ago it was? About 200 years ago, um, Farmers at this location, Swindale Beck uh, in the UK, they straightened the river. So they, um, they wanted to straighten the river, one, to make space for more agricultural land use, and two, to speed up the flow of water. Um, but, some, but more recently, uh, folks realized that this was actually destroying the river ecosystem. The water was moving too fast, the fish could no longer lay their eggs successfully, so all of the fish disappeared uh, from this region, and then 
after straightening the river 200 years ago, a few years ago, they spent a lot of money to put the bends back into the river. Uh, so this is an extract. Uh, I think that just summarizes what I just said. Yeah, the main thing is they straightened the river because they wanted to improve their ability to use the land for farm. Uh, they, more recently, they decided they didn't want to use the land for farm anymore, but that straightening of the river had unintended consequences. Uh, the salmon and trout couldn't spawn, and it also made the river uh, muddier uh, because the increased flow of water uh, caused more sediment to be picked up into the flow of the water. So here's a picture of uh, what the river looked like in 2009, so after it had been straightened. Um, and then this is what it looked like after 10 years of work, putting the bends back in the river to, you know, this took a considerable expense. Um, so this is the more natural state of the river. Um, and indeed, it did, bring, it did bring back the salmon and the trout. So they straightened the river, then they returned it back to its natural state based on the whims of what the humans at the time wanted. So I guess the point of this story is that humans are indeed capable of affecting ecosystems, both in sort of good or bad ways. Uh, that's again, like a human imposed uh, qualitative notion, um, but also, with not just intended outcomes, you know, they straightened the river to make space for more land, which they did. So they're not only intended consequences, but they're also those unintended consequences, like straightening the river got rid of the fish in that river, at least along that stretch. So this is something to bear in mind as I start to discuss how we as humans might use ecological networks to inform how we manage ecosystems, particularly as this is becoming an idea that's more and more uh, happening because of climate change, urbanization, all of these impacts that humans are making. Uh, we're also trying to redress the issues that we're causing, uh, but in doing so, yes, they're going to be intended outcomes, but they're also going to be potentially even more unintended outcomes. I've shown this paper a few times in the context of robustness, uh, where we look to characterize how robust uh, different uh, land uses in cities were uh, from the perspective of plant pollinator communities. Uh, but one thing that I haven't mentioned previously that I want to now is how we use different types of method and lines of inquiry to understand the system. So in addition to performing the robustness analysis of the plant pollinators that we networks that we collected in different kinds of land use, so we went to parks, we went to people's gardens, which is an absolute nightmare to do, uh, we went to cemeteries, we went to nature reserves, uh, we collected networks, we looked at the robustness of those networks, we also did a whole bunch of other analysis in order to better understand the plant pollinator system in urban environments. So we collected data on floral abundance across the city, pollinator abundance across the city. We, we didn't sample everywhere, these are projections, but we sampled uh, easier to collect abundance data at more sites than we were able to collect interaction data. Um, we also spent a lot of time collecting socioeconomic data on where people uh, on where people lived, on their gardens, with the idea of trying to understand does biodiversity correlate with people's socioeconomic status? Does their wealth affect the biodiversity around them, either positively or negatively? Does their level of education impact? the diversity of plants and pollinators in various different neighborhoods. We also partner with the local government in these four UK cities to help advise them based on our findings, the optimal seed mixes for road verges. So I don't know if you have that phrase here, uh, but you've got roads and often the green space directly next to roads is managed by the local government. And often local governments will want to make them look nice because people like it. Um, so they're going to be planting flowers, grasses by the sides of roads. Is there a mixture of plants that we can you know, place there that facilitates uh, pollinator diversity? both in terms of supporting native pollinators, but also I think particularly important in cities, 
uh, sort of stepping stones that allows pollinators to traverse cities. And that's why roads are particularly important, by giving them floral resources that are sort of like rest stops for the pollinators as they move throughout the city. So we did robustness analysis, but that was just one component of a larger mixed method study where we were interested in getting a more complete idea of plant pollinator communities in cities. I also want to re-mention this work by Aislinn Keyes, who really pioneered the assessment of ecosystem service vulnerability to species risk. So I introduced this initially in the context of robustness analysis, where in addition to the uh, nodes being species in a food web, she also included uh, ecosystem services provided by those species as additional nodes and looked at the vulnerability of ecosystem services based on the removal of species. So this is a relatively simple idea. I mean, no one had done it before, uh, so it's kind of cool, um, but it ended up being a really helpful way of quantifying the potential impacts of species loss on ecosystem service provision. And more importantly, it can be used to guide protection strategies. So uh, when we're focusing just on food webs, it's really hard to motivate people to say, okay, well, which species should we focus on protecting uh, if your goal is solely to uh, maintain biodiversity overall, maintain all of the species in the food web, that's a much tougher sell to people uh, who don't inherently care about the integrity of a natural system. But by relating the vulnerability of the system to the services that people get from the network, from the food web, then it's a better way of motivating people to care about protecting nature, but also focusing on, okay, if you want to maintain bird watching as an ecosystem service, because these birds feed on these fish, then these are the fish potentially lower down in the food web that you need to protect. I also uh, want to mention another thing that I really like about Aislinn's PhD dissertation is that she included an entire chapter on making research more accessible to people. Uh, so she uh, helped produce this, um, uh, I guess it's an online robustness game where you have um, a food web and your goal is to choose certain species uh, to protect in order to minimize the number of secondary extinctions that occur. Uh, so uh, this is the URL uh, for the game. Um, I was honestly kind of disappointed in myself for how badly I did. I spent years studying this kind of thing, but um, I didn't do a very good job. Uh, with protecting these ecosystems. Uh, this is one of the hardest ones. There's uh, some simpler food webs, so you really eased into it. But part of the dissertation was about using these kinds of games in undergraduate education to get across ideas about complex systems, about protecting ecosystems, and essentially try to make uh, the study of these ideas more accessible more understandable and hopefully more fun for the students. So I don't know if that's something that you can do here, uh, but I was really pleased to see that ASIN was able to incorporate that in addition to sort of four chapters on more regular uh, academic research. So now I want to turn uh, my attention to social ecological networks and uh, it's a very simple idea conceptually. So far, I've just been talking about ecological networks, uh, connections between nodes that represent different species. Uh, there's also a whole body of work that involves social networks, uh, connections between different social entities, uh, who's friends with whom, which people sit on which uh, boards of companies. There's a whole bunch of social networks Facebook is a primary example, but there's many other ones. Uh, social ecological networks are simply the combination of networks representing an ecological component with networks representing a social component, and then also the interactions or the relationships between social and ecological entities. So I'll show you an example of a social ecological network uh, in a second, but first I want to give you some idea of how this idea came about in the first place. And it really started, although it wasn't really understood at the time, from, this is a really influential paper 
uh, by Garrett Hardin uh, from 1968 called The Tragedy of the Commons. And the basic idea of the paper that uh, Hardin put forward is if you have a common pool resource, something like a nice field of grass that everyone has access to, but there are no formal rules for who can use that grass, uh, then everyone is going to maximize their individual use. So if you're farmers and you have uh, cattle and there is some really lush grass, you're going to let your cattle feed on the grass. And if you're solely interested in optimizing your individual benefit from that, you're going to try and let your cattle graze for as long as possible. And everyone's going to do that because they're going to maximize their individual benefits. And then ultimately that resource is going to be quickly used up and then permanently destroyed. Uh, and that's what Hardin refers to as the tragedy of the commons. He sees that as the uh, unavoidable outcome of having natural resources that are common to everyone, common pool resources. So that's the tragedy, and Hardin says there's no way of escaping that final outcome. Uh, anything that isn't top-down managed is going to be destroyed. Well, this flies in the face of basically all of our understanding of human history, where throughout time, humans have been able to successfully manage common pool resources without having some government say to them, these are the laws, here are the permits for you being able to use this land. Uh, so this point was rigorously demonstrated by Eleanor Ostrom and summarized in her really seminal book, that evolu uh, governing the commons, the evolution of institutions for collective action. This came out in 1990, but summarized a large body of work uh, that she developed, basically presenting examples and general sociological theory for how people did self-govern the commons, why this tragedy has been avoided over and over again in human history. And indeed, this work was so influential that Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize in Economics for this work. And she was actually the first ever woman to win the Nobel Prize in Economics. Uh, what's actually kind of sad is she won it in 2009. To date, still only two women have won the Nobel Prize uh, in Economics. And um, speaking to colleagues who worked with Eleanor, this award was really not well received by the economics field uh, in general, which is a real shame um, because this was a massively influential piece of work. But as you probably expect, there was a whole bunch of sexism involved in people really disregarding this award. But Eleanor um, has contributed remarkably uh, not just to um, the sociological aspects of understanding how the commons are governed, but thinking really carefully and contributing a lot to the discourse on social ecological systems. She was one of the first pe people to realize that most environmental problems that we conceive of nowadays are not really, are, shouldn't really be characterized as environmental problems. They're really social environmental problems, social ecological problems, because the environmental problems we care about can't be separated, can't be isolated from the effects of people, either people causing the environmental problems or there are people integrated very closely with the systems themselves, whether it's people living in the Amazon, people trying to manage natural resources, there are really no such thing as purely environmental problems. There are only socio-environmental problems. So she makes this point over and over again, and this has really informed a lot of work, including in modeling, where people have really tried to understand the very difficult problem of modeling these socio-environmental systems. It's difficult enough to model ecological environmental systems. It's difficult enough to model human systems, uh, governance systems. How are you gonna go about modeling socio-environmental systems, where those two components are so tightly integrated with one another and they draw on very different literatures, uh, they draw on very different theories of how the world works, and even now there is no good coherent theory for understanding how socio-environmental systems function, how they should be managed, even though it's probably one of the greatest challenges of our time currently. So this is a really nice paper about social environmental systems modeling uh, in general. And one of the approaches that we use are social ecological uh, networks. So here is um, 
uh, an illustration from a science paper by Orion Bagan, who I think visited here not that long ago. Uh, he's a colleague of mine who's really driven uh, work on social ecological networks. And here's a schematic of what I was talking about earlier. You have an ecological component. You have a food, marine food web down here. Uh, you have the social component, you have fishers, who knows whom, who might share information with one another. Then you have the interactions between the social and ecological components, which fishers are targeting which fish primarily. So this is the general starting point for conceiving of social ecological networks. Now, it's still not clear whether this is even a good conceptual framework. Is this too simplistic? But this is the obvious place uh, to start. And before I took up my current position at the City University of New York, I was at uh, an NSF uh, research center called SACINC, uh, the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center, where their goal was to bring together social and natural scientists in order to try and figure out ways of solving these socio-environmental uh, problems. Uh, and I was there primarily to drive research on social ecological networks, and I was involved in a number of working groups who are really trying to think through these problems, both using networks and more generally. And uh, we came up with four sort of key areas. So if you're interested in this kind of work, these are four areas that we identified as being sort of stumbling blocks or boundaries to effective uh, work in this area. So the very first thing that we noticed is, uh, and this should come as no surprise to you, there's lots of jargon involved, because each discipline has its own jargon. Sometimes the same word is used to mean different things in different fields. That's very common. So a starting point, you think this might be obvious, but very rarely happens, is when we bring together researchers from different fields, we spend a lot of time just getting people to explain to one another what the different words mean when they're talking about either the same thing or different things, what's important to them, what their area of study is focused on. And this also extends to what is a bit less well understood, but we really learn uh, uh, succinct, is how important the different professional and practical goals are in assembling effective teams. You know, you can even think about this from a purely academic standpoint of you take someone from physics, you take someone, someone from anthropology, they want to publish in different journals. The style of publishing is different. And if you're trying to get a physicist and anthropologist to work with one another, the anthropologist is not necessarily going to value the kinds of journals the physicists are publishing, and vice versa. And that's actually a massive stumbling block. Even before you get to figuring out what kind of problems you might be able to work on together, it's getting people to care about the output of the collaboration, how you can have a mutually beneficial system. It's also worth noting that this kind of work is also professionally not really advantageous for most people because it takes so much additional energy to learn about a new discipline. It takes so much energy to spend time maybe contributing to a paper that is going to appear in a journal that is not going to count for your tenure or for your promotion or for your thesis. Um, if you want to involve people who are trying to apply the research that's valued even less by people in university. So you are really pushing against the current structures and the reward systems that don't consider this work currently to be particularly valuable. So that's something that we realized, OK, you just got to get this out in the open, because if you don't, it can cause a lot of conflict as a project develops. From the perspective of the more physical sciences, I think one thing that we really needed to do was uh, convince people about the value of a mixed method approach. Now, this is more common in the social sciences where it's very difficult to propose good mathematical computational models for explaining social systems. It doesn't really, do. the social systems are too complicated that any single mathematical model is gonna do a good job. So often social scientists will use multiple different kinds of methods. It might be interviews, just speaking to people. It might be statistics, it might be some agent-based models, and often they will combine all of these different methods to answer one particular research question. So this is something that's not really done in the physical sciences, that we had to convince physical sciences that this was a valid way of understanding uh, a system. And part of that is to emphasize that qualitative data is can be just as valuable as quantitative. 
there is still sort of a hierarchy of what at least physical scientists tend to think of, of as being like legitimate modes of study with sort of quantitative data right at the very top. And we spent a lot of time trying to convince people who had backgrounds in the physical mathematical sciences the qualitative data, qualitative data could be useful to understand both your physical models, but could also be used to inform and parameterize those models. But a lot of it was really just building empathy between the different researchers uh, involved in a project. One sort of more practical thing that was a bit more straightforward to do was make sure that you match the spatial, temporal, and organizational scales across the social and ecological components that you're studying. Um, it sounds obvious, but as you come from the different backgrounds, you are clearly focused on different areas of study that have different natural timescales. You know, social scientists study things on the order of whatever they study. Uh, natural scientists study things on their order. I already discussed here how you can have ecological timescales, evolutionary timescales. You know, it's hard enough trying to get people who work on the environment natural systems to appreciate the different temporal scales. Imagine trying to do that between social and natural scientists. Uh, but if these are all things about let's have a discussion before you sit down and do work. And then a final thing that's also relatively practically uh, able to implement is moving from single case studies, which has been the main model, uh, both in the natural sciences, where you have your study system, a field site at one particular location. Someone has a field site at a different location. Same thing with social scientists. They study one particular phenomenon at one particular place, but it's really moving from that model of doing research to having multiple case studies that can be compared to one another, because that really helps with generalizing the kind of uh, findings that you would get from individual case studies. Being able to at least intelligently link uh, the case studies that you're choosing that can contribute to forming a more generalizable body of knowledge. So I'm gonna end uh, where I started with this idea of decolonizing uh, ecology, and sort of in general beyond ecological networks, I'm heartened to see this push to decolonize not just how ecology is taught, but have it as a fundamental part of research itself. Uh, I really like this paper by Christopher Schell, because uh, it introduces some core concepts of decolonizing ecology, and I've used that term in a very broad sense because it's going to be situation independent, which country you're in, what kind of legacies uh, and impacts you're talking about, uh, and I should stress this is very much from a US-centric viewpoint, um, but it introduces a lot of really core concepts to decolonizing ecology, decolonizing uh, research more generally, and it has a number of excellent examples uh, from urban ecology. So the general framework that Shell is considering, uh, the title is the Ecological and Evolutionary Consequences of Systemic Racism in Urban Environments, and again, I want to stress that this is a very US-centric view, is uh, Christopher maps out the impacts of residential segregation, which has a large history in the US uh, based on ethnicity and race, seeing how that impacts the distribution of resources, both socioeconomic, uh, but also uh, natural, uh, and how it impacts the landscape heterogeneity, and then finally, how that's impacting biological community diversity. So this kind of mirrors a bit what we try to do in the plant pollinator study is understand how socioeconomic factors like the relative wealth of neighborhoods, like the relative education level of people who live in certain neighborhoods, and how that could be a correlative factor in influencing uh, ecological diversity <laughs> in cities. Uh, and what's also kind of cool is that Christopher also presents a hypothesis for the effects of segregation on urban food web structure. And this marries kind of nicely uh, the move towards uh, focusing on ecological networks, not just in so-called pristine natural environments, but trying to make them more relevant for informing decision-making by looking at uh, ecological networks in urban environments, where the vast majority of people are based. And Shell sort of takes this idea one step further by trying to understand how uh, residential segregation, how differences in socioeconomic status can impact the landscapes in cities and then in turn impacts the distribution of species across cities, how it might impact um, their traits, 
and ultimately how that impacts network structure, where we see an arguably familiar hypothesis that the more uh, diverse a landscape is, the more complex and intricate the food web. So I think this is a really nice way of going from the more abstract concepts of just decolonizing a discipline, thinking about its history, thinking about the social impacts of how science has been done, to actually understanding how it has a material effect on the objects that we study as part of a scientific discipline. So I'm going to end uh, with a few thoughts. Uh, I'm going to begin uh, with the origin of the species, which is where I started this entire masterclass, uh, and emphasize that although not quite in name, but ecological networks illustrated here by Camerano's, uh, what I would claim is the first ever ecological network, although he didn't use that term, uh, that this idea of complex interaction networks has been a fundamental part of ecology from the very outset. And then through time, uh, networks, uh, food webs became a small but influential area of study in their own right. Uh, so this is uh, Elton's book, Animal Ecology, which was the first sort of compendium of food webs. Um, and at this point in time, the study of food webs, which is a kind of ecological network, really became its own thing. You could legitimately study them, uh, but it was still sort of a relatively small area of ecology as a scientific discipline. I think now ecological networks uh, are becoming more and more common, uh, particularly in terms of educating students. So in some ways, we've come full circle where the idea of an ecological network is permeating back into the understanding of ecology more generally uh, as a discipline. So this is a popular textbook uh, in the US and the UK, Introduction to Systems Ecology, and now ecological networks have their own chapter. They're uh, once again part of the canon uh, of knowledge of ecology. Ecological networks have even influenced uh, other disciplines. So here are two examples. Uh, where ecology, work in ecology uh, has sought to explain phenomena in finance, uh, published in the Journal of Statistical Physics, um, and also how the idea of nestedness, uh, which was really driven at least empirically in ecology, uh, has moved to explain the organization of networks in other kinds of systems, so in this case, uh, trade networks. And to me, I'm excited to see that ecological networks are being thought of as a tool as much as they are a discipline. So as a method, a lot like linear regressions or community detection algorithms, uh, there's always going to be research on ecological networks in their own right. It's what I do, uh, identifying new structural properties, the relationships between different structural properties uh, and function, but increasingly they're being used to serve a particular purpose to assess, say, the effectiveness of different management or policy scenarios, and they're often being used as part of a mixed methods approach. So in combination with other information uh, and other methods uh, themselves, which I think is really nice, because as I've tried to stress uh, often with conversations, networks are just one way of representing the world. And there are some methods and their networks are useful for some purposes, but not for others. And part of building a really reliable knowledge base to use these networks is to understand where they are useful and maybe where they have limitations. And that's not unique to networks, it's common to any kind of method, which is why mixed method approaches, I hope, will become more and more common. So in that regard, I would say we're moving on from the necessary first step of drawing maps of uh, Darwin's Tangled Bank, identifying these common features like motifs and nestedness to using uh, those maps. And with that shifting goal, uh, especially when you're using ecological networks outside of research, they will come to need to redraw those maps. So we have ecological networks, they're one representation through the lens of a particular researcher, but there's no reason why you can't for the same system have a different form of ecological network. This is an effort known uh, in the social sciences as counter mapping. Uh, this is where usually people who have relatively limited power and influence in a system leverage the inherent power of maps. Maps as a visual tool, as an organizational tool, as an analytical tool to redress any kind of perceived injustices and also push their own goals when maybe they don't have as much power uh, as others who initially drew the map. So 
Here's an example of counter mapping I really like. Uh, this was actually presented to The Hague uh, in 2015 at the Planetary Security Conference, and it shows a modified version of the global map that we're all familiar with, uh, increasing and decreasing the geographical area relative to who is selling arms, so who is selling weapons and who is buying them. So this is one way of redrawing a map in order to make a specific Point. And you can find various different examples of this kind of work, but it really summarizes the goal of counter mapping. And I want to relate that idea to the ability for researchers to choose to use networks, redraw networks for particular purposes. So I'm going to leave you with this as my final thought. My hope for the future of ecological networks is they're seen as a great way of helping you get from where you are to or what you know to where you want to go. All right, so that's it. Thanks for listening. I hope that was interesting. Uh, I'm going to be around for a bit longer if you want to talk to me. Otherwise, feel free to email. Thank you.